Okay, this is lecture 3.1. Here we will be talking about constructionist theories. Uh, as I've noted, the um, positivist theories are favored more by law enforcement type people. Uh, constructionist theories tend to be more favored by uh, social scientists. Uh, constructionist theories of deviance are less interested in causes of deviance uh, than they are in uh, the type of people that create deviance and how those people get to be who they are. Uh, we concentrate on the meanings of deviance themselves. So we uh, observe that behavior is dictated by meanings, by the meanings of the deviance. What does that act mean to the person rather than uh, is it against the law or not? Uh, labeling theory uh, within the three core sociological perspectives uh, falls pretty clearly within the symbolic interactionist perspective. Uh, so just a reminder, quick refresher, again, uh, this is going to be super, super quick. Um, we learned in sociology, uh, introduction to sociology, that uh, structural functionalists view society as a web of interconnected social structures. Conflict theorists state that uh, society is basically a interconnected um, web of ways that the powerful take advantage of the powerless and symbolic interactionists are most interested in how uh, symbols have meaning to people. So there are two central ideas to labeling theory. First is that deviance involves interaction between deviant people and conventional people. Uh, in order for something to be classified as being deviant, um, the, the deviant, the criminal, the weirdo, has to interact with someone who is quote unquote normal. Uh, and the interaction between deviants and conformists is governed by two factors. The meanings that both parties assign to each other's actions and reactions. So what does the conventional person think of what the deviant person is doing? What does the deviant person think of what the deviant person is doing? What does the deviant person think of what the uh, conformist thinks that they're doing, right? That, there's a little web there. And then we're also interested in the causes of deviant behavior uh, not being as important as the labels of that deviant behavior being important, right? We're not so interested from this perspective in why you would steal a thing but what does it mean to you to steal a thing is stealing a thing a really horrible act that could that you think of as makes you a bad person or is stealing a thing eh, something nobody will miss anyway labeling theorists are also interested in official labelers i.e people in authority that can make decision who is the criminal who is not the criminal so we're interested in prison police judges uh, prison officials uh, various types of social workers various government agencies etc and um, we also point out that conventional morality and power is generally rich and white those people who uh, judges uh, those people in high levels of authority often have more money than the rest of us. And it's a sad fact that um, the people in power are overwhelmingly um, white of European descent. Labelers have the ability to avoid negative labels despite engaging in deviant behavior. What does that mean? Well, that means that... Um, a police officer can get away with things that you wouldn't necessarily be allowed to get be able to get away with right that doesn't mean that all police are criminals but uh, because we hold police officers to be these agents of the law we don't expect them to be breaking the law so therefore they're less likely to um, be punished for that Labeling theory states that deviance 
labels produce negative consequences for those receiving the labels. So those people that we say, okay, you are a criminal, that means something for them. And if those labeled as deviants start to see themselves as being deviant, then the deviant behavior will continue. So, if you ever are in the life of a, a young person and you see them starting to get labeled as being a bad kid, you need to try to do something about that. Because once the individual is labeled as being a bad kid, then um, they will start to internalize that. And once a child starts to think of themselves as bad, starts to see themselves as um, deviant, then that will start um, seeing deviant acts as being acceptable acts. And that is really a spiral that can get out of control very quickly. This in psychological literature is sometimes known as the halo and horn effect. Uh, Lemmer uh, identified uh, stages of deviant identity. Uh, the two biggest and most important ones are primary deviants and secondary deviants. Uh, Lemmer observed that the initial act of deviance uh, is the one that occurs before the devi deviant label is applied or accepted. And um, this is interesting because uh, this theory basically contends that we all do deviant things. We all um, speed on the highway or... Um, might pop a grape into our mouth at the grocery store, which I suppose is technically stealing, right? But those most of those acts of primary deviance aren't caught. And the whole system doesn't start until someone is labeled as being a deviant person. Secondary, de but if someone is caught and is labeled as being deviant after that pr primary deviance, then it can lead to secondary deviance. So secondary deviance is continued deviance that results from deviant labels being applied and internalized by the social actor. So um, after somebody starts to think of themselves as being a bad kid, or after someone starts to think, eh, shoplifting isn't that bad, the shoplifting they do after that point, or the fights that kid gets in high school after uh, he s continues to feel that think of himself as a bad kid that is then called secondary deviance um, another uh, theorist within the labeling theory school is uh, Erickson uh, he stated that deviance creates positive consequences and this is actually very similar to Emile Durkheim's ideas of deviance as well. So Erickson sees deviance as being good for a community, group, or individuals that apply that label. So it's looking at why we as a society choose to um, label people as being deviant. And when we identify people as deviant, uh, the act preserves and strengthens social cohesion and social order. Let me put this a different way. Um, we need, from this perspective and from a lot of Durkheim's ideas, uh, they would state that we need criminals. And the reason we need criminals is because we need people to point to and say, look at them, they are the bad one. Look at that person, look at how bad that person is, and we're going to put that person in prison. And if everyone in our world knows that we put bad people in prison, and that's what happens to bad people. Then we can go to the grocery store. Then we can interact with our neighbors. Then we can go to our classes and know that the person sitting beside us at the computer lab isn't going to stick a shiv in our kidney and kill us, right? Because we put criminals in prison and criminals are in prison. They're not out here with us. Now, labeling theory is not without its critics. Uh, labeling theory doesn't really explain the causes of initial deviance, that primary deviance, right? It basically makes the assumption that everyone does deviant things. It's just a matter of who is caught. Um, and it also makes the, the assumption that, this de that the deviant label does not encourage 
further deviance unless uh, internalized. So uh, if someone is thought of as being deviant uh, but do doesn't necessarily do any further deviant things, uh, the community just thinks that he's a weirdo. Um, that's kind of harder to understand in terms of labeling theory. Um, another uh, sociological theory uh, relating to this topic is phenomenological theory. Uh, this theory explores people's perspectives regarding uh, their consciousness of deviance, so how aware are they that the thing they're doing is deviant, their perceptions of deviance, how they perceive the social world, uh, what they think is deviant or is not deviant, so their attitudes to deviance, their feelings toward deviance, and their opinions about deviance. Um, now let's compare this to really understand phenomenologists. Uh, we need to compare them to positivists. So positivists are law enforcement types, think that humans are passive objects where behavior is determined by forces beyond our control. So positivists like to think a lot about the social structures in society and those hold people in place. Phenomenologists then see people as being active subjects capable of intending and carrying out their own behavior. So uh, phenomenologists don't think about those social structures and they think about how people themselves are deciding or not deciding to do those acts. Uh, positivists study abstract meanings in an objective way while phenomenologists study situational meanings and the subject's interpretation of their behavior. So um, this is again somewhat related to uh, our symbolic interactionist friends uh, that are more interested in how people interpret the situation as opposed to uh, the, um, the uh, absolutes of the statistical studies. Now phenomenologists are not without their critics. Uh, phenomenologists have been unable to develop a practical way to understand deviance. Um, they uh, are largely influenced by their own beliefs and their own ideas and their own judgments. And in this way, um, a lot of phenomenolog phenomenological uh, theories are hard to apply to the study of sociological deviance itself. Which is why um, conflict theory comes in. Now, you will, if you've taken, if you've completed your social one on one class, I'm sure you uh, will remember conflict theory. Uh, modern conflict theorists are interested in two types of conflict regarding de deviance social conflict and po co cultural conflict, and both of these lead to crime. Uh, first of all, at the core of conflict theory, we are interested in how powerful people oppress uh, the people who they oppress. So competing groups have incompatible interests, needs, and desires. The rich want to stay rich. They want to maintain their wealth and they want to maintain their power. The poor want to get rich and they want to have some of that power, right? Those are competing interests that are not compatible with each other. So that is one type of uh, conflict that can lead to crime. Cultural conflict then is discrepant norms and values relating to what's right or wrong. Do uh, the people in your community, uh, what are their attitudes toward drug use? What are their attitudes uh, towards uh, intellectual property? What are their attitudes toward uh, gender and sexuality? How does that match up with the people who are in charge, right? So uh, first thing that's coming to my mind, uh, Rastafarian subculture sees marijuana consumption as uh, a holy act, as a fine act to do, as something that is uh, should be part of a normal life. Well, um, those who are in power, uh, particularly conservative lawmakers, 
in the Washington, D.C. area, the city itself, not necessarily where the politicians are, um, they had different ideas about that, and they see marijuana as inherently bad. Well, there are a lot of Rastafarian people that live outside of Washington, D.C., right? So how does that conflict play out between those people that think that marijuana use should be part of everyday life and those people that think that marijuana use is an inherently criminal act, right? Where, how does that conflict play out? That is something that conflict theorists would be interested in. Uh, Chambliss identified the difference between law in the books and law in action. And this is a real interesting element in terms of uh, how conflict theorists would view deviants. Um, they observe that enforcement of the law is often unfair and the interests of the ruling class and uh, ruling racial groups uh, are strongly favored. So um, we see this in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Uh, there have been, has been an observation in that movement that law enforcement seems to not value um, black lives and effectively their message is black lives matter too. Not black lives are the only lives that matter, but that black lives matter too and that black lives should matter as much as white lives, but apparently they don't, right? Um, that is the conflict at the center of that movement. Uh, if you've seen Making a Murderer on Netflix, um, that is a very good example of law enforcement um, making an enemy where they see an enemy, right? And taking advantage of the poor and the powerless, right? And they say there were two people involved in that crime, so God damn it, there's gonna be two people that go down for that crime, even if one of those people was barely aware of it. Um, that's what conflict theorists look at. Quinney blames unjust law on the capitalist system. Again, if you're familiar with conflict theory, you know that they are incredibly uh, critical of capitalism. And this calls uh, for political action against the powerful classes who inevitably criminalize the powerless. So therefore, um, we would look at things like uh, property laws. How are those property laws set up to help the rich and powerful? Um, how to go back uh, to marijuana legalization in those places where marijuana is becoming legalized who is able to take advantage of that legalization is it the rich who know how to do the legal maneuvers or is it the poor who might uh, take a more traditionally um, less than legal way of growing those things, right? It's going to be the rich. The rich are going to be the ones that in the long run benefit from marijuana legalization. Um, and this is, again, fertile grounds for studying conflict theory. Uh, feminist theory uh, looks at... Feminist theory is its own set of theories, but it does tie in very closely with conflict theory. So when you're studying conflict theory, you can often hop over to feminist theory pretty easily. Feminist theory looks at theories of deviance uh, that are primarily about men and not women. So they see that the laws are set up um, around traditional male behavior and what happens to females or how are females set up to deal with the criminal justice system that is oriented toward traditional male behaviors. Um, and it looks at the way women interact with the criminal justice system in different ways that men interact with the criminal justice system. And that is a study in and of itself. Um, very, very interesting. I mean, there's a reason why uh, women's prisons look different than men's prisons. There's a reason why uh, there are different percentages of people in women's prisons as opposed to male prisons. And it's not because women are inherently weak and not capable of dealing with prison. It's um, 
there's some very inherently sexist things built into the criminal justice system. That hurts, honestly, hurts both men and women. Power theory is another sub-theory within conflict theory that emphasizes how power and equality affects deviance. So, who is prosecuted, right? Is it the person that has the fancy lawyer or is not, or is it the person that defends themselves, right? So the person with money is the one that's going to be prosecuted. Who is found guilty, again, the person with money. And what communities are targeted? A pay poor inner city black community is more likely to be seen as dangerous than a uh, middle class semi-rural white community, right? And if you have more police in a given community, more crime is going to be found because the job of a cop is to find crime, right? And this can lead to imbalances in demographics in the, in the prison system, for example. 33% uh, of the uh, people in prison are black, while black people only represent about 12% of the total population. That's a major statistical um, difference, right? Uh, and a lot, most uh, criminologists point to uh, the fact that black communities are targeted as being dangerous as a, even if they aren't dangerous, uh, as a major, um, major cause of that. The powerful are more likely to get involved in profitable deviance than the powerless. So um, the powerless tend to engage primarily in less profitable deviance. So, uh, for example, uh, I've already mentioned in another lecture that uh, drug dealing is actually a really terrible way to make money in terms of your ability to make money. You're not going to make a whole lot of money uh, selling uh, cocaine, for example. What will make you a lot of money, though? Uh, white collar crime, uh, embezzling money, uh, taking a little money off the top of uh, a business that you might be sort of involved in, right? That is a highly profitable form of deviance, and it actually is uh, unlikely to get caught. Uh, in any given uh, poli police force, there might be, of 100 people, there might be a small handful of people dedicated to catching white-collar crime. Um, yeah, so it's, you're, you're a lot more likely to get away with it without getting too fur, far into the weeds there. Now, there are some criticisms of conflict theory. Uh, conflict theory assumes that a utopian socialist society would be free of deviant behavior. Uh, conflict theory assumes that everything can be blamed on inequalities in society and the capitalist system. Uh, obviously, that's not the whole truth, even though it is a major assumption of conflict theory, um, not everything does come down to power imbalances, um, but a lot of things do. So uh, conflict theory is relatively useful. Um, here we have table 3.1. Uh, these are our constructionist theories of deviance. This is also listed in your book. Uh, if you want to uh, understand how uh, conflict theory lays out, labeling theory, phenomenological theory, and uh, then we have a further breakdown of that. And that is the end of uh, this lecture. Um, let me know, as always, if you have any questions, and I'll see you in the message boards.